Behind every mask, there is a face. And behind that face, a story. Penned by author Marty Rubin long before this pandemic, this idea has never been more true or more important to understand. We all have a story. That's true for you, as it is for us, the more than 9,000 people behind the masks at University Health. We come from different places. We bring a wide range of skills and experiences, and we've come together like never before to serve, to innovate, to lead, and to give everything we've got as one team. This is our story. In December of 19, Donovan and our emergency management director and I happened to be having a conversation. And we had both seen an article about a virus in China. That's all it was. Probably a week or two later, it's January. We're talking again. There's a little bit more talk about this virus. I said, Donovan, we're going to get ready. Through the Southwest Texas Regional Advisory Council, all area hospitals were already working together. I think we got a jump on the rest of the country. We had a lot of our mechanisms in place before a lot of other places did. And then the other thing is because this city and this region, they stand together on everything. I think that made probably the biggest difference ever. Just day to day, that's how we operate. I think us being right here in San Antonio, having evacuees come stay here, we were really beginning to get prepared. Our team pivoted quickly to meet immediate needs and plan for the uncertainties ahead. And I still remember going into our senior leadership meeting on Monday morning and I said, I think we should close our clinics and do the right thing. What we did within ambulatory is we actually met as a team and we determined which visits based on specialty could be seen uh, via telephone or video or which ones had to happen face to face. We also needed to get testing in place quickly. I think that more than anything, we needed to keep our providers healthy. Honestly, I think we all realized early on, not just that, but the ancillary staff as well, you know, you've got to have clean sheets, you've got to have meals. So it, it was very important to keep the workforce that supported the hospital that cares for the patients healthy and able to come in and continue to do their job. The lab team knew this would not be business as usual. We went from some departments that were not considered stat, not considered business need to be 24-7 to those departments running 24-7. We converted conference rooms into laboratory spaces. We hired additional staff and created additional job duties. A large team worked to set up a drive through for healthcare workers. So we got that up and running actually pretty quickly and the basis of that actually morphed into what eventually moved out to Henry Freeman Coliseum and the multi-lane drive through and testing center. Our goal was to get to a place where we could process between five and 7,000 tests per day because in the beginning, we didn't know how each surge was gonna impact us. We also needed a team to call people with their COVID test results. I said, guys, I'm gonna pull y'all in because y'all are the fastest, smartest people I know that are around me in my team. I said, We're, I think this is about to hit us hard. I know I'm pulling you off your other jobs, but it'll be quick. We know now it wasn't going to be over quickly, but having a direct resource for our staff has made a huge difference. And for us to be able to be on that phone and just reassuring them and saying, you know, we're all, you know, the, it's so cliche that we're all in this together. But UHS, we are a family. I felt like we were sort of their person, their people to, to come to and say, hey, I'm scared to go to work. And it was like, I am too. But we have patients to take care of. Providing everything needed to help our staff be safe was also a huge priority. If I was one of the patients in that bed, I want my nurse, my doctor, my technicians, my supply people to be the best taken care of people on the planet because I want them to be able to think about me and not worry about if they've got what they need to do their job. It was certainly intimidating walking into a COVID room for the first time. It was, um, it was almost like a, a surreal moment because you hear about it in the news and it's right in front of you now. Early on, because so much about how the virus spreads was unknown, many in healthcare were really scared. I think like everyone, we all have loved ones that could be immunocompromised, or I think like the worry, the most worrisome part was taking it home, and I never wanted to like have it affect someone that I love when I go home. I have a son, he's 10 years old, and 
I was so worried about him. He was with his dad for four months. He didn't let me to see him because I worked in COVID area at the beginning, and it was really hard for me. I had physician tell me that they strip themselves completely in their garage, go into their shower, and then separated themselves or secluded themselves in a, in a room so that they did not go around their children not knowing if they had contracted a disease. At the same time, our team stepped up in extraordinary ways. We were needed more than ever. We were doing a lot of things when this hit. We were in the middle of implementing our new electronic health record. All along we were doing that, we had to fix other things because guess what started arising? Okay, we need employees to work from home. Okay, we had to provide that technology. We need telehealth visits, Bill. Okay, we had to provide that. I was trying to wrap my arms and hands around as much as I could do for the health system, for our community, for our patient. The first time when we, um, we got the notification that they were gonna be discontinuing electric cases, I said, what are we gonna do with our staff? So immediately I started calling different departments and seeing how we can repurpose or reallocate our staff. So when we realized that a lot of doctors would be working from home, we had additional staff who could help us with the screening of patients at the facilities that were truly open. And staying open required a continual focus on critical supplies. Gloves, gowns, face masks, that's our primaries. Then you've got things like shoe covers, boot covers, bouffants. I live in that inventory. We were concerned about the shortages of N95 masks and availability, and so our department, we invented a process on how we could reuse or extend the life of the N95 masks using the hydrogen peroxide process by our Sterad machine. And so we wrote up a process disseminated throughout the health system, which we adopted, which also the FDA recognized as a process. When the transport media for COVID tests was in short supply, we made our own. So we bought all of the elements, we sterilized them, and then we compounded the viral transport media. And we actually compounded media for almost five months. And in that five month time period, we made close to 50,000 viral transport media tubes. We've seen a true spirit of collaboration. We see that on the COVID ID team. Folks that didn't have to be deployed to help us would just volunteer. I mean, just a lot of residents and others that really wanted to step up to help us. At first, we started off with having like extra support staff, like people, we had, we called them gatekeepers. And so if anyone was going in, we would watch each other as we're going in, like from putting on the gown, the mask, the gloves, and our face shield, and just double checking before you step in. When I go inside, I check everything, whatever they need, supply or whatever, or we have with biohazards, with everything. I just make sure everything is fine in the room. If they need something, we ask them, and some of them, sometimes we have conversation with the patient. It's really been amazing how we all work in such different departments, and we all do such different things. But when we all come together, it's amazing what we can do. We know many hands make the load a little lighter. That was especially true when we began to see a rapid surge in patients. Relatively quickly, the medical intensivists were overwhelmed. There were just not enough beds, not enough intensive care medicine faculty to take care of all the really sick COVID patients. So at the end of June, the trauma service, we developed a second large COVID ICU in University Hospital. So in the ICUs, we have had the green team, the trauma team, who's made a major impact. You know, I think across the board, you know, our hospital medicine teams have really been, you know, tremendously helpful. Our pulmonary critical care team has really been expert in the way they've approached this. And uh, unfortunately, our palliative care team has also had to really step up because this has really been a hard time. There was one day that was just, before we even came on shift, we could hear the alarms going off. We heard the code blue going on. You, you were already bracing for it. It was gonna be a rough day. And the chaplain did a wonderful job just kind of breaking that angst. Healthcare teams like ours, we're used to emergencies. In fact, we're experts in crisis response. And this is going to sound silly, but we just, we fix everything. I, I Honestly, I just, you know, there just hasn't been much of anything that we've come up against that as a group we haven't been able to fix. You stand up, you do what needs to be done, you get your patients taken care of, and you get back to normal life. Managing COVID-19 has been nothing like that. It became very apparent to us within the first couple of weeks of managing COVID that this was a disease like nothing we've ever seen before. We do a lot with ventilators, especially with COVID. 
um, a lot of high flow nasal cannulas, which is just delivering oxygen at higher flows and making sure people are comfortable, they can breathe well. I think about when I worked in the emergency room and I could respond to heart attacks. I knew how to deal with ketoacidosis, I knew how to deal with trauma, and it was over then. And so while I see now there's sort of a light at the end of the tunnel, I still feel like this is the biggest unknown. The normal medications we use to control inflammation and the normal medications that we use to control uh, infection really were sort of performed sort of erratically. It's such a new thing for me and it's it's such a shocking thing because you get, you know, age ranges that are anywhere from, you know, early 20s to late 80s and it's it's uh, case by case. There are days when you just don't feel like a very good RT. You know, you feel like you've tried your best, you can't think of anything else to do and you just have to realize that COVID's a horrible disease and it's, it's very unpredictable. The persistence of the pandemic has been one of the biggest challenges. The physical part, yes, it's exhausting, but I think the emotional toll that it takes on our staff and, and uh, you know, everyone who's involved with the patient care, and definitely you get attached, you form these relationships, and unfortunately, uh, a lot of them don't make it. You're used every day to coming into this job and it being different. But the last year, that difference has been so out there that, you know, it's you come in some days and you just have to go in your office, close the door, take a breath, say a little prayer. I think no one really realized the psychological impact of a pandemic, living in the pandemic, coming to work in the environment, seeing your other coworkers struggle with it and manage with it. It is a lot to take in sometimes. And even like, even now, like sometimes you come home and you really think like, man, did this just happen? Because you really don't think about it until you get home and you kind of settle in your emotions and everything. There's a, a day that had a young man and he started off, you know, just needing mask and high flow oxygen uh, to, to be comfortable. And he just rapidly deteriorated requiring uh, the breathing tube and he died before the morning. Just to see the, you know, the, the nurses and the respiratory therapists literally sitting in the hall crying. So many people ask, what keeps you coming back? Our team here, whether it's from the ER all the way up to the, you know, the top floor, um, I think we do what we do, we do really well and we take great pride in it. The connections that we make with one another that really helps us get through it. We had our first like transition into ACU from ICU and it was such a big celebration and um, all of us lined up in the hallway and we clapped and we were so happy and I actually heard that patient went home. So it was nice. There was one patient in particular I was able to wean off of high flow completely and um, they had been very sick over in the unit and I was, it was a very happy day for me, you know, and um, the patient said thank you and it was just, it was, it was nice. Playing a major role in worldwide efforts to improve treatments for COVID-19 definitely brought a good feeling and lots of pride. In fact, currently we're participating in six different investigational studies surrounding just COVID-19. And I'm excited to report that in two of those, we are the number one enroller in the world for these investigational studies. So I think it's offered research opportunities for our patients that frankly they wouldn't have otherwise had. And it's been something that has been really gratifying to our team and our patients have enthusiastically participated, but sort of our staff. And, they should be rightfully proud of the efforts they've made to improve outcomes in this terrible disease. We also helped establish a community-wide infusion center to try to reduce the need for hospitalization. And the purpose of these monoclonal antibodies is to use in patients with mild to moderate infection. And so we actually started our own pharmacy at the Freeman Coliseum. We set up a location where we could compound on site, provide services. But over time, it's grown to service 90 patients every day. A big day in this battle was the day our first shipment of COVID-19 vaccine arrived. We focused on protecting our team 
and on January 4th, stood up one of the first hub vaccination centers in the state. The real story is George and I met at Wonderland Mall and we were having a lot of others come through. And I told George, this is how I'm going to do it. I'm gonna do this, 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 this. Any questions? He said, looks great. Everyone else came to the mall and he says, we're done, Bill's laid it out. And so it stayed that focus and, and that methodology and, and I just ran with it. And I remember walking through with uh, Mr. Hernandez and Bill and going through how we would bring these patients in. Um, and we uh, ordered supplies, got our staffing going, and by Monday we were up and going. When it came to managing and mixing doses, the pharmacy team stepped up again. You only have five days once you actually take it out of the deep freezer to coordinate actual administration of the product. And then when you actually just start to mix the product, you only have six hours once you've mixed it. So yeah, it was a huge logistical piece that we had to work through. Even before the vaccine arrived, our supply team took action to avoid any shortages when they heard needles and syringes would come with the doses. I turned right around, started looking at sources, started talking to procurement. I said, I need you to buy every one cc and three cc syringe you can find, and this run of needles. And I don't mean boxes, I mean pallets. And they did. The right needles allowed us to start getting that extra sixth Pfizer dose from day one. Getting shots in arms is about hope for the future and saving lives. You know, when you look at it, um, a lot of the elderly that show up have told us, this is the first time I've been out of my house in a year. I have hope that this shot will protect me. I have hope that now I can see my grandkids again. I have hope that I can see my friends. I have hope that I can see my other family members. So many patients would come out and say, you know, you saved my life. You saved my life. And for patients to tell you that, it just makes everything, what we do, just more, more important. I've never been so tired in all my life, but I go home at night knowing I'm gonna get up in the morning and we're gonna to continue to affect thousands, thousands, two to 5,000 a day that leave there and say, you know, thank you so much. We've heard people call us heroes. It made me cry. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate that. It helps you keep going. You know, I, I, I appreciate the admiration of calling us heroes, but this is what we went, this is what we were bred to do. I'm just really thankful that I've worked at an organization that recognizes everybody from food and nutrition services to plant engineering to EVS to laboratory as working as a whole as a part of the entire medical and clinical team. I've never seen myself as a hero. This has been my mission. This has been my calling. This is what I signed up for. And I don't, I don't ever go to bed at night thinking, wow, girl, you're just a hero. I can't describe it, but it's a feeling inside that is just overwhelming that we're helping people. And, and the feeling of that is unreal. I mean, I was in my office before the vaccine clinic. And it was the day the Blue Angels did the flyover. And I filmed it, and I had the same feeling. It's like, wow. And my grandson went and watched it outside at their house. They went to a location to watch it. And I got a text, and it said, Papa, that's for you. We are grandpas, grandmas, moms, dads, sisters, brothers, and neighbors. We come to work, we put on our masks, and we bring our best to make a difference, to beat this virus. We are honored to care, to serve, and deliver hope for the future. <laughs>